If you're moving to Boston and have limited experience with the city, you need to be aware of the considerations in this video or else your car could end up looking like this. More details on this predicament later in the video. Before we start, subscribe if you have an upcoming move to Boston or if you just want to learn more about the city. My goal is for you to learn just one helpful hint that makes your move or time in Boston smoother. So if you're moving to Boston, you're probably looking for an apartment and you've no doubt seen how ridiculous housing prices are in this city. Now, multiply how much you're expecting to pay in rent per month by three because that's how much you could be paying to move into your first apartment. Prior to move in, it's common for units to charge based on your credit, first month's rent, last month's rent, and a broker fee equal to your first month's rent. Oh, and a security deposit, which you can technically get back. So if your rent is $3,000 per month, you might want to budget $10,000 just to move into your apartment. When I moved to Boston, I knew what first and last month's rent were, and I've dealt with security deposits everywhere, but the fee that surprised me the most was the broker fee. I'll try to explain it, but it will be difficult, not because I don't understand the process, but because the whole concept of a renter paying a broker fee is a corrupt racket that makes no sense. The first step that does make sense, landlords hire a broker to build the listing, conduct the showing, and complete the leasing process for a vacant unit. This part happens all over the country, but in these places, the landlord pays the broker, while in Boston, the renter pays the broker. And it's not some $400 finder's fee, but a few thousand dollars in rent. You can't expect me to believe it costs a few thousand dollars in labor to take a picture of an apartment, write up a listing, put it on the internet, and then complete a leasing agreement through a process that could probably be automated. That is not worth one month's rent in Boston, in my opinion. Maybe I need to go be a broker and quit my current day job. I could see why these brokers could be valuable pre-internet, but come on, this should be the cost of doing business for a landlord, not a renter. But if you are a renter, just understand that's the way things currently are in the city. Anyways, the takeaway, expect to pay a broker fee when you're moving in to your apartment. Some apartments do offer no fee, so be on the lookout for that, but just don't be surprised when this price comes up. Side note, critics have pointed out that forcing landlords to pay the broker fee will only cause them to pass on the cost in monthly rent to the renter. And I mean, that's probably what I would do if I was a landlord, but as a renter, I would still rather have that cost broken up over the length of the lease as opposed to handing someone a few thousand dollars in one setting. Also, if I was a landlord, I would try to find a cheaper but equally as effective way to complete the leasing process that didn't involve someone scamming me out of a few thousand dollars. Landlords are businessmen and women, and I think passing the cost on to them would do more to drive change in the broker fee process because right now no one is forcing the prices in the broker fee process to go lower, and I think landlords looking for a cheaper way to do business would lower that price. Okay, I'm off the soapbox. Time for the next consideration. You need to know that many apartments in Boston are old and they were built before the invention of modern amenities that we're used to today. Old apartments are charming on the outside, but some are so old and have such a layout that it's neither economically nor physically possible for a landlord to put in a washer and dryer or dishwasher. Many buildings put laundry facilities in a common area, like a basement, but for the rest, you'll have to do your laundry at a laundromat. If you don't like sharing or waiting on laundry machines, make sure they are included in your unit before you sign a lease. Similar to the laundry situation, many apartments in older buildings have outdated heating systems, which means they can create a surprise expense in the winter time. If you see an apartment whose price makes it look like a steal, see if heat is included in your rent. If heat is not included in your rent, you will need to increase your budget for the winter months, and this can be a very hefty increase. One advantage of newer units is that they tend to have heat included in rent, and if they don't include heat and rent, their heating system is usually more efficient and can end up costing you less. The next consideration of moving to Boston, parking. Parking in Boston can be a nightmare or expensive, and sometimes it can be both. The good news is that street parking is free for residents within their neighborhood. Uh, the bad news is that you're not guaranteed a spot near your apartment, just somewhere in your neighborhood. And parking spots can be hard to find even if you do have a permit, so you kind of just have to take what you can get. And sometimes you'll spend valuable time only to end up parking blocks from your apartment. Additionally, if you elect to use public street parking, you will have to move your car for street cleaning. Timelines of how often you'll have to move your car vary per neighborhood. And if you don't move your car, you'll be towed, which I guess guarantees you a parking spot somewhere else in the city, but it also means you have to pay to get your car back. As I teased at the beginning of the video, you also need to be careful about which public spots you park in. Many residents put space savers in open spots to guarantee a spot in front of their apartment. If you see a lawn chair or a trash can in a spot, do not move it. 
If you do, someone will egg your car, key your car, slash your tires, and or write you a mean note. Now, you might think, wait a minute, my permit is the same as this person's, I should be allowed to park here, and your logic is not wrong. But the way things should be versus the way they actually are are two different things. If you do call the cops, well, they don't really care about your car being keyed or your tires being slashed. They've got other things to worry about. So in summary, yes, it's not fair that petulant people like these get to win and imagine how good of drivers they are too. I bet they cause lots of accidents on the road. But if you park in one of these spots, something bad will happen to your car and there will be no consequences for the person who did it. I should note, if the mayor declares a snow emergency, space saving is allowed up to 48 hours after the snow emergency ends. However, I've seen space savers used at all times. My advice to you is to just respect space savers and not deal with any of their headaches. To avoid the issues of street parking, you can choose to live in an apartment that offers a private parking space, but these typically cost a fair amount of money on top of your rent. A parking spot in the West End or Back Bay can cost $400 to $500 per month. And as you go farther out from the center of the city, it can shift down to $200 to $300 a month, which is still kind of a hefty price tag just for a parking spot. While parking your car is one challenge, it can be just as daunting driving in Boston. Boston drivers are referred to as mass holes, and I found that they live up to their reputation. I'm from Austin, Texas, which has bad traffic, but the drivers in Boston are far crazier and far more ruthless. While every city has unsafe drivers who will cut you off and blame you for going too slow or being too cautious, Boston just seems to be far, far worse. So keep your head on a swivel when you're on the roads in this city. Additionally, these bad drivers are going to cause you to pay more than the national average in car insurance. Oh, and gas in Boston is also higher than the national average. With all of these vehicle considerations, you might want to consider going without a car if you can manage. If you work on the T, not owning a car is definitely a realistic possibility, and you won't be alone. Plenty of people in Boston do not own a car. While a moving permit in Boston is not legally required, it is certainly worth considering for your move-in. For $69 to $110, you can guarantee yourself two parking spaces for the day of your move. If you forget to do this or opt not to, good luck finding two spaces near your residence for your moving truck. Additionally, you would otherwise have to clog your street with your truck, and if you don't get ticketed for this, you will definitely knock it off to the best start with your neighbors. Lastly, if you're planning on moving to Boston on September 1st, either reconsider your moving dates or plan wisely, especially if you're moving to Alston. There are an estimated 200,000 college students in Boston, and as you can expect, most of them move in on the first weekend of the school year. This creates quite the demand for any moving supplies during this time frame and clogs the streets with moving trucks and vans. Also, if you're looking for a lease at this time of the year, start early because depending on what neighborhood you're looking in, you will be competing with these students for a place to live as well. If these move-in dates can't be avoided, the best advice I can give is to plan early so that you can limit your headaches on the day of the move. So this concludes my video. Please let me know in the comments if there are any additional tips you have for new people moving to Boston. If you're moving to the city, subscribe to this channel for neighborhood guides and tips similar to the ones presented here. And please like the video if you enjoyed. Thanks for watching.